Thank you very much. Um, as luck sorry, sorry, before you start, I, 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 yeah. I completely forgot to properly introduce yourself. That was because I was messing with, with, with Zoom. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, so let me quickly introduce no. uh, introduce you. <laughs> Uh, so Marissa holds an, an MA in Applied Linguistics from the NWU and has been working as a computational linguist and project manager first at CTEXT, which is also at the NWU, and then at UNISA since uh, 2009. She's taught various modules in the BA Computational Linguistics program at the NWU and has most recently gotten involved in the Carpentries uh, as a helper and instructor. Um, Marissa is currently the project manager of the Sadiler UNISA node, where the African WordNet and multilingual linguistic terminology are under active development. She is also enrolled as a PhD student at UNISA and hopes to show in her research how the limited research, uh, resources available for South African languages can be used creatively to, to produce more complex HLT tools. So sorry, sorry about that, um, Marissa. I hope that introduction was good enough and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Menu. Um, better than I would have done it myself. So thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, just a note, I'm leaving my video off. Apologies for being so rude. Um, but as luck would have it, our bandwidth today is not that great. So I am hoping that at least my voice is clear and not too too many breakups in between. Please, if that is a problem, um, please stop me and we can try to fix that problem. Okay, so as many said, um, I'm currently with UNISA and have been for a few years. And um, I am the project manager for the two projects or actually one project to sub projects that I will be discussing today. And my aim with this talk is really just to give you some insight into what we what plans we have made, what challenges we have faced in building these two uh, linguistic resources, um, perhaps for others who are in the same boat and thinking that this is completely impossible with the little resources that we do have for the South African languages, uh, perhaps to give you some hope. And then perhaps for people who are more um, electronically and automatically inclined uh, to give you some ideas and some food for thought on how you can also be involved in the humanities and help us to overcome some of these challenges. All right, so in this presentation, I'll just give a quick introduction to the two linguistic resources that we are building, um, our approach and different things that we've tried to speed up the development what we've learned from that, and then just a few suggestions and conclusions uh, to wrap it up. So in our um, big, bigger project with Sadilar, funded by Sadilar, we have two sub-projects. The first one of these is to build WordNets for the South African indigenous languages. And we are currently building nine such WordNets. I'll get to, to the details on those in just a minute. And the other sub-project is to build a multilingual term bank focusing firstly specific on linguistics and then in a follow-up project we also hope to follow to focus on some literary terms. So let me first introduce you to what a WordNet is in a nutshell and on the screen there you can see the links to two of the most prominent WordNet projects. The first one the most prototypical WordNet is that um, developed at Princeton uh, for American English. And the screen that you see there is an example of how a SIN set, which is the building blocks of a WordNet, is displayed in the Princeton WordNet. Now you'll see there um, that I searched for the word noun in Princeton WordNet, and it gave me um, not only a definition, but also quite a few other synsets 
that are semantically related to the word noun. And this is exactly what makes a word net different to any other electronic dictionary. Not only are there words, terms, with their usage examples and definitions, as you would find in an electronic dictionary, but then we also go one step further to add hyponymy, meronymy, um, antonymy even, and synonymy is a big building block of a word net. So different synsets or different concepts are grouped together based on their semantic relations. And we do that, um, well, the latest trends have been to do that in a very graphical manner because then you can easily see these building blocks and the different relations between them uh, add to each other and add to the meaning. So what you see there on screen um, in the middle is the synset for foot, and to the right-hand side, you can also see the definition and the usage example. And then you can see all of the different synsets, each in an orange block, that are in some way related to this base concept. And here we can see that there are things like big toe, uh, various um, arteries, the pedal extremity, flat foot, and various other things that roughly share a conceptual relationship with the word foot and with this specific meaning of the word foot. Of course, there will be a picture like this for foot as in a unit of measure as well, and then also one for foot as in the lower end of a bed um, and all of the different words, all of the different concepts that share the word foot. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, the African WordNet project started or it currently aims to build WordNets for nine South African languages. And it started in 2007 already with an initial workshop hosted by Professor Christiane Faubaum, who is the founder of the Princeton WordNet, and she came to South Africa and we invited um, at least two linguists for each of the South African languages who at that time showed interest in such a project. And she showed us the basics of building a WordNet, some pitfalls to be on the lookout for, and showed us the way forward for the South African languages. We then started looking for funding to do this important work, and in 2010, officially started development for Isizulu, Isikosa, Setswana, and Sesutu Saleboa. We then incrementally added the other languages. 2013, we added Javenda. 2018, Sesutu and Seswati. And most recently, in 2019, we also added Setswanga and Isindabele to the project. Currently, we are busy adding more synsets or building blocks to these nine word nets, and we are also expanding on the semantic relations already um, included. Another important milestone for the project was that SADILA, the South African Digital Language Resource Center, officially became the long term host for the African word nets in 2018, ensuring a more sustainable future for this resource as well. Now, during that initial workshop in 2007, Prof. Faubaum made it abundantly clear that the expand approach is more often than not more successful for less resourced languages. Now, using this tried and tested ontological structure of the English Princeton WordNet and then translating the synsets from American English to our target language is the basic principle by which the expand approach works. The advantage of this that there is that there is no advanced language resources needed, and it's a less complicated approach for an inexperienced team. Remember that at that stage, all of us had only had this one workshop in WordNet development. The disadvantages of this is that it is a labor intensive task that it requires advanced linguistic knowledge from the team 
and it is quite time com complex as well. And the other thing that I will talk about a little later on is that we initially wasted quite a bit of time on unlexicalized concepts that appear in the American English um, structure that we were following, but were not necessarily concepts familiar to the African context. Now we started using this expand approach and we currently include roughly 70,000 synsets across the nine languages with Susutu Saleboa and Isizulu being the two bigger languages in the project. We did try to use what little additional resources we had available to link word lists to the Princeton WordNet and not just translate from scratch. So we um, acquired the use of the English Vendor Bilingual Dictionary of Murphy and then also the comprehensive Northern Sutu Dictionary of Seed Fuchel and Mokohong for research purposes. We also downloaded a Setswana English Dictionary, as you can see, quite an old one, already published in 1925. And then team members were very kindly made a selection of private bilingual word lists for Isiklosa and Isizulu available to the project to try and speed up our development in this way. And since this is all that we were able to lay our hands on, we had to make the most of what we had. So what you can see there is um, our basic process in this example. So what we did was to take the bilingual word list, use the English side of that word list to search in the Princeton WordNet. Now remember that this is the structure that we wanted to translate into our languages, into the South African languages. And we very, very um, rudimentarily filtered some of the hits that we got from the Princeton WordNet to say that it at least had to be the same part of speech where we had that information. Um, we also said that we are only interested in the first two senses of a word and they are, are organized based on frequency. So our thinking behind that was that if it is a less frequent sense, then perhaps it's not a very good match or not something that we should spend our time on anyways. We then extracted those matches where the English side of the bilingual word list, word list matched a synset in the Princeton word list. We very simply put those in Excel sheets um, to eliminate the use of complicated software and also this was during that time when we when we were first and very rudely um, load shed for large portions of the day. So we needed an or an opportunity to work offline and to work in little bits of time when your laptop battery could still help you. So we chose to work in Excel and the linguists very simply had to say, yes, this is a good match between the Princeton WordNet and the bilingual dictionary that we had available, or no, this is not a good match. For those cases where they said that it was a good match, we then extracted all of the additional data, such as the part of speech tag, the ID, uh, the domain, some semantic relations from the Princeton WordNet, and simply transferred that information onto the African language translation to create synsets in the software that we would like to use to browse the word names. Now this approach did work and we created about 7,000 additional synsets in that way in a much shorter time than had we simply um, translated them from scratch, but the problem was still that there was a lot of unlexicalized and unfamiliar terminology that was coming to the fore. We then decided to try and Africanize our very Eurocentric seed lists, and we used the sole comparative African word list 
compiled by Keith Snyder and James Roberts, published in 2006, to try to alleviate this problem. Now, this list has 1,700 words with both English and French glosses resulting from linguistic research in Africa. So our reasoning was that at least this would be more context sensitive. The items are also organized semantically under 12 main headings from man's physical being to animals and grammatical items, making disambiguation a bit easier. So our hypothesis, creating a more localized South African English source text and then translating this into all nine South African languages would fast track the development of new syntax. But, and this is sort of a happy coincidence that we um, are very happy now to report on, it also forms a multilingual parallel subcorpus of commonly used concepts. So the same 1,700 terms would then be available in all nine of the South African word names which is very handy for all sorts of machine translation and other natural language processing tasks. Okay, so the basic workflow here, you take the English term from the so-called list, compare it to the Princeton word next to find a possible matching synset and extract more data, as well as with the Open Educational Research Term Bank, which I will talk about a bit later, and we filled in the official South African languages to find a possible definition for the synthet. This English data set was next sent to South African English lexicographer to expand so that each term from the SIL call had an English lemma, definition, and usage example. The lexicographer also localized the data to the South African context as far as possible. This complete set of English synthets was then sent to the translators to create an equivalent in the nine South African languages that form part of the African WordNet project. And this work was done in spreadsheets again to eliminate the need for advanced software training and was done by freelance translators, not part of the African WordNet team at that time. So we then ended up with this multilingual parallel corpus of we of a thousand synthets translated into all nine languages. That data was then imported into the software that we use as browser for the WordNet called WordNet Loom. And the semantic relations between the words were still insert by hand. We felt that this required advanced linguistic knowledge that we could simply not just take over from the English. And as you can see here in the exam example uh, for Isizulu, there are various words that have more than one possible translation into the African language. And we also wanted the opportunity to add those extra senses. All right, so what did we learn from these two attempts at increasing the number of synsets at, and increasing our working pace for the African WordNet project? First thing is that the existing data contain, contains errors that we could identify and correct semi-automatically. I will talk about this just now. And although the, the translators did an excellent job, many errors were still also present in the translations. So our, our experiment to try solve these was to create language independent SQL scripts uh, to identify and correct these errors. And initially we stuck to the very basic things, correcting capital letters where they shouldn't be, punctuation marks where they might seem out of place, empty mandatory fields, and invalid or incorrect information in fields with set values, for instance, for part of speech or semantic relations. We also learned that the South African English source text certainly made a difference, but we realized that each language would also present unique challenges. 
translation for WordNets was definitely a specialized activity. And we are very happy that the translation, the freelance translators that we used for translating of the so called list have since become valued members of our WordNet team and have been upskilled in this way as well. One such example is where African languages often use euphemisms to refer to taboo terms and are the, and are the preferred form in some languages. For instance, in Tsonga, the concept of breaking wind or farting is rather described as in the same way as to kill an insect. For the African WordNet project, we decided to include both as synonyms with a tag to indicate this taboo term. You can also here see an example of a lexical gap where there is no distinction in the English Princeton WordNet between plates used by children and those used by adults. They do have different types of plates, such as dessert plates, dinner plates, uh, paper plates, salad, soup plates, and a steel plate, but none, no differentiation based on the use or the user of the plate. And for my, many of the South African languages, this is a very important distinction where different types of plates are reserved for use by children or for serving your guests or for serving specific um, dishes. And we needed a way to also include this knowledge. Another lexical gap that we identified is that in English, there is no distinction between a gourd and a calabash, where that is very two very distinct types of dried shells in, for the South African languages and are also used in very different ways. So luckily, WordNet Loom gives us the freedom to include much of this indigenous knowledge. And what you can see on the screen here is an attempt for spoon, bowl, and plate, or eating utensils, to further um, suss out some of the different terms used for different types of bowls, spoons, and plates. We have also published an article on the different beer drinking vessels for Isizulu, and that was very interesting. I'll share the link to our project website where these research outputs are listed, and I do encourage all of you to go read that interesting article as well. All right, then on to the second sub-project, the multilingual linguistic term bank. And first, what is a term bank? Well, the most prototypical one for South African education domain is probably the Open Educational Resource Term Bank, created by the University of Pretoria in conjunction with other partners. And this term bank aims to include terms in quite a wide variety of subject areas, as you can see on the screen there. It is also completely open source and free to use by anybody. And I encourage you to go look at the website shared there um, and see what they have created. As for our project, we identified a need for standardization of terms in African languages and specifically those used in the linguistics classrooms. Different source languages for different students sometimes meant confusion when it came to de defining some of the terms they were asked to use in the classroom. And we identified that a freely available, editable and standardized term bank for linguistic terminology would be a possible solution to this problem. And we also envisage, envisage this to be used in classrooms from a very early age, so as to also instill good standardization uh, from the earlier grades. Our process in developing this was to initially 
uh, perform semi-automatic term extraction after digitization of old UNISA study guides that we got permission uh, to use in the project. But unfortunately, strange fonts that were used quite a number of years ago and other technical problems meant that this was not a feasible solution for our project. So what do we do when we can't use the technology to our advantage? Well, we got a, a team of experts together. They sat around the table um, and they came up with a list, a manual list of 500 terms commonly used in a linguistics classroom. It was very important that the team of experts was a multilingual unit so that they could give insights from all nine of the South African languages. It was also important to us to not focus on an English base, but to rather create something for the South African languages from the start. This process saw us drawing up different Excel sheets again, Again, the low tech solutions seem to work the best in our environment with load shedding, uh, intermittent internet access, and just ease of sharing the data with each other. The linguists who work on this project were also familiar with Excel already and did most of their editing work in Excel. So we went with what they already felt comfortable with. We included fields such as uh, the term in the African language and of course in English, a definition in those two languages, then also an African language usage example, the source of that example if it was not an own creation. We also left space for some notes and for synonyms in the see also column. Next, we decided that we do want to share this information in a bit more easily accessible way than with the Excel sheets. And we discovered the wonders that is Lexonomy. Now, this is an open source cloud based uh, platform for writing and publishing dictionaries. It is very easy to use, and I'll show you the basic steps for setting up a dictionary or in our case then a term bank using the software. Setting up the structure of a dictionary or then as we use it for a term bank is very easy and you can specify all of the different child elements, sibling elements that you would like to include for each entry. Here you can see that we included um, categories for each of the nine languages for English right at the top, the term and the definition as the basics. And then we also included child elements for each of the fields from that Excel sheet for the term, the definition, a source for the definition, the usage, the C also, and the notes. So after you've set up the structure in Lexonomy, it is quite easy also to start filling it in. And here you can see the entry for an adverbial phrase being built. And apologies for the slight spelling error on the left of the screen. This was corrected. And it is also very easy to correct all of these types of errors and um, standardization problems in Lexonomy. And what you can see on the screen now is what the ultimate product will look like. So there you can see um, the adverbial phrase with its definition, then the same information in Isizulu and in Susutu Saleboa. And our aim is to now also complete this for with the information for the other seven languages so that we have a multilingual entry for each of the 500 linguistic terms in this project. Okay, so we have already begun thinking of improvements that can be implemented immediately. And these include a better understanding of the use of the translations by both the English lexicographer and the African language translators. Uh, we thought 
that we had explained, especially the WordNet project very clearly. But when we started seeing the translations, we saw that the contextualization was still a bit lacking. And this might simply be due to inexperience of the team and not feeling comfortable yet with changing the English based terms as provided to better suit each language context. To eradicate this problem, we provided more training and we also improved the style guide to include more details in detailed instructions with examples in the various languages. We also consider that where possible closely related languages such as, such as Isizulu and Isikosa could benefit from sh shared translations. Some other improvements that we want to implement will take more work and more time. For the African WordNet, for instance, it would be beneficial to add morphological analysis or as a minimum limitization to the quality assurance pipeline to check that the lemma is used in the usage example, for instance. And this will reduce the amount of confusing sentences. For both projects, we'd also like to include other quality assurance measure, measures, such as spell checking, checking for mandatory fields left open, or invalid values for some fields directly into the development interface. But this is still a long-term goal. In conclusion, yes, before you ask, all of the data developed in both of these subprojects will be made available under the Creative Commons license via the Sadilad Language Repository resource repository. And we hope that this, these two very basic resources will increase natural language processing development, particularly for the African languages. Currently, we have WordNets for five languages available via Sadilad. Uh, repository, and we hope to release new versions of those five word nets plus first versions for the other four languages by the end of this year. Unfortunately, COVID has halted our quality assurance process slightly because we could not have the workshops that we had hoped in to ensure the quality of the word nets available for download. We will also be making all of our development data in Excel format available via the repository so that those who do not necessarily want to use the SQL versions can also work in a more manageable or more familiar Excel format. Then something else that we want to also highlight is that nothing beats a good old roundtable discussion to sort out some of the standardization problems or find more creative solutions. We often think that we need to solve some of our digital humanities problems with more technology, and we then forget that the person in the office next to us perhaps already has a solution that we simply need to find a way to incorporate. So we want to stress that our team has been vital um, our team working together and sharing ideas, sharing their work and not being too precious about what they have created is vital to the success of this project. And we could not have done any of this without the 40 odd linguists who have worked on the two sub projects. And here you can see some of those roundtable discussions and workshops, training workshops that we've had. We have had very successful workshops in especially development of definitions hosted by Dr. Marietta Alberts. We have had colleagues from the Roslav University in Poland who are actually the developers of the WordNet Loom interface that we use for WordNet development. They came to South Africa and um, gave us some advanced training on using their software platform. And we've also had a lot of sharing in smaller meetings where different language group, groups simply sat around a table, made a pot of coffee, and came up so, with some very creative solutions to some of our uh, unique language phenomena and how to 
uh, incorporate those into the digital and the electronic format. And that is my entire story. <laughs> so I think we now have some time for questions. Right, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, we do have time for questions. Um, okay, I already see a question in the chat. I hope, I hope you're ready for this. Uh, so Tanya says, absolutely agree that low tech solutions like sitting down and talking, oh, um, Wait a minute, the, the chat jumped there. Uh, so, and talking to each other can be a good approach. Okay, that was not really a question. Uh, Alan Murdoch says, aside from linguists, did you also require the assistance of other professionals, e.g. computer programmers, or were the linguists proficient in programming, or was programming not necessary? So, no, none of our linguists were proficient in programming. Um, I am trained as a computational linguist, so I can script to save my life, but um, definitely not to the level of creating new software um, solutions to some of our pro problems. When we started with an advanced quality assurance phase, we did enlist the help of a professional uh, programmer to write those SQL scripts that I mentioned, and that has really been vital not only to save some time in checking back on specific things to fix a simple error like an extra punctuation mark, but also to extract some fields where a linguist might need to have a second look. There might be um, a term that consists of five or six words where we could perhaps lexicalize that with a single word or a much shorter phrase. And the help of a programmer was instrumental in extracting those simple synthesis um, and only looking at that. Okay, thanks, I hope that answered the question. Uh, so Tanya has a question on localization and culture. Do you have a sense of how big the changes to the initial structure of the data was based on localization and hence culture? Um, so we, we don't have a sense in the statistical um, in a statistical manner yet. Um, but what we have done so far is to look at certain categories or, or phenomena that we know are apparent in all of the South African languages. We have, for instance, looked at the kinship terms, which in South African languages are much more complex than in English, for example, even in South African English, where the gender of the speaker um, also influences the term used in a kinship term or in a greeting. Um, the, the age of the person that they are talking to influences that entire construction. Um, and we feel that it is important to not only give the basic or the more um, prototypical terms, but to also color in, especially the word nets with these more culturally specific phenomena. So yes, to answer your question, we've identified a few of these sort of categories and are working through them one by one. Um, to include the indigenous, indigenous knowledge and culture in the word nets. Okay, great. Thanks. I actually have a uh, I have a whole list of questions as well. So this is a question kind of related to the uh, the previous question. So I was actually wondering how do you decide what words to add? Uh, so you can't just um, uh, you know add all words at the same time. So you need to make some sort of selection that holds for both the word net as well as the term bank um, uh, projects. So how do you decide what to include and what not to include and in what order? So initially we, for WordNet specifically, we started with the so-called base concepts. So this is a list of 5,000 words that the Global WordNet Association uh, made available for startup WordNet projects. Um, in a way to just get them started. And it aims at including the most frequently used universal terms uh, for most languages. We did find that those were very much Eurocentric um, basic concepts. It 
for instance, included names of birds and trees and um, concepts like that that we simply do not we simply do not have those birds and trees in South Africa. So linguists were spending spending quite a bit of time to try and fit the meaning into the South African language structure, and it was a waste of time. Um, we then encouraged linguists to sort of explore their own um, creativity and their own interests when developing new sensets. So for the Setswana language uh, word net, for instance, we one of the linguists is also a translator for an agricultural um, publication. So his interests and his area of expertise is definitely agricultural concepts. And he included quite a large number of those. Then in the later stages, when we started using this um, sole comparative list, we really start, um, tried to read through those and exclude all of those foreign concepts and focus on the very basic ones. So it's, it's, it's a case of um, you start with sort of a seed list, but everyone is then free to expand on that as they want. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so follow-up question uh, from Tanya. So is it mainly an expansion or is there also a reduction? Uh, Tanya, there is definitely also reduction, um, not necessarily for the very basic concepts, but definitely when you start getting down to the more detailed synsets, uh, like I just mentioned, the names of trees and birds and things that we simply do not have here. We are not saying that they do not have a place in the African word net. We are only saying that for now, where our word net is, we don't want to spend time including those when we could be focusing on more frequently used concepts. Okay, cool. Um, so a question from Rueda, how do you deal or handle the standardization of the languages you work on? So consistency in orthography is always an issue. It is always an issue. And even with a very specialized linguistic team um, who are all either um, uh, teaching at university universities or actively involved in translation, um, and creation of resources, even they sometimes differ as to what the form is that we need to include. Our approach has always been that uh, more is more in this case. So what we have tried to do is then to include both terms, but to definitely add a tag if one is more preferred than the other. For instance, those taboo terms that I mentioned, where the euphemism is often the one most frequently used, but there is a more biologically accurate term for, for instance, bodily functions. Um, so we've included both and marked them as such. Of course, this is not so easy to do in the terminology list because there you kind of need to pick one and standardize in that way. Um, and we have there allowed ourselves to be guided by published dictionary. Um, and then in the case where there really is different orthograph orthographic forms being used to then include both with a tag to say that they are synonyms. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm not sure if there are any more questions. I don't currently see any questions in the chat. Uh, I have a more technical question. Uh, so I saw that you're using um, Excel for a lot of different things. I was actually one, and, and then you mentioned that there are sometimes some, some errors in, in the data. Uh, for yeah. example, a part of speech information where people, um, I guess, start adding either um, incorrect tags or something else in the wrong um, in the wrong part. Um, so why exactly are you using Excel? So if you're collecting information, you might as well use something like an online questionnaire system. 
that allows you to specifically say, um, you know, you can only pick from these values for this field. Have you thought of using something like that? So it's definitely a long-term goal of ours to um, add things like that to, for instance, the WordNet Loom interface, also some quality assurance checks that you can't save a synthetic, for instance, if certain mandatory fields haven't been filled yet or whatever the case may be. Um, our consideration was purely practical. Uh, our linguists are all working on this project part-time and do not necessarily have a very stable internet connection at home. And while well, this was all pre-COVID when we all moved to much higher bandwidth and uncapped packages at home, um, people simply did not have the means to, um, to be online the entire time. I also mentioned briefly that we had the load shedding and connecting to an online interface that was on a server, that was on a different load shedding schedule. It became a nightmare for about two years during the initial um, development. And we simply decided, well, let's use what most people are familiar with then. And definitely, I agree with you that that leaves a lot of room for error. Uh, but at that stage, we opted for the option that would actually get us developing something, even if it was not perfect. OK, I completely understand. Thanks. Um, I see another kind of cheeky question here. Your title included proudly South African. Uh, would you care to elaborate? Well, every time when we present any of our research at international uh, conferences, people are always so, so flabbergasted by the fact that we aren't simply taking big data and big bilingual dictionaries and just popping them into a WordNet or a term bank format and calling it a day because that is what most of them are doing. Um, most recently, I remember seeing a WordNet for uh, Japanese, I believe it was, or one of the Jap languages spoken in Japan at least, being created in 90 days. Um, and it is bigger than what we hope to create in about 20 years. Um, so much of our considerations have definitely been to contextualize to the South African environment, to include things that we find useful here, and to do that in a way that works for the unique challenges that we face. We have also had a strong focus on including not only, shall I call it scientific and um, more bigger concept, but definitely also including indigenous knowledge, including those small differentiations in meaning and in definition that truly um, show the South African context and truly show our rich and vibrant cultural history in this linguistic resource. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Somebody still wants to have, wants to ask a question, they're welcome to do so. Otherwise, I would like to thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, and I think we had a nice uh, discussion. It, it's really interesting. So you present information on, on, on this project and then all kinds of kind of related questions pop up um, where you think it when you present it it's it's an easy project you see it's a lot of manual work um, mm -hmm. but then it turns out it's really not that easy and there are a lot of kind of fine fine details that that you need to uh, to think about uh, so I really enjoyed that so thank you very much uh, I don't still don't see any questions so I think we're uh, we're, we're done with the questions no but thanks for the presentation um, yeah, I know we can we can talk about this for hours, um, but thanks. All right. Have a good day, all. Thank you for your participation as well.